Today on Blue 58, the Packers have brought back Mercedes Lewis. What does it mean? Well, as far as the tight end room goes, pretty much nothing. But what the Packers are doing this offseason in general points toward one very interesting conclusion. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I am your host, John Meerdink. Happy to be with you here for another episode. Mercedes Lewis is going to be back in a Packers uniform for another season. Two-year, $8 million deal. The guaranteed money varies a little bit depending on who you ask. Tom Pelissero and Adam Schefter have a couple different figures out there. Really doesn't matter. I'm assuming this is pretty much just two years for cap reasons, but if things go really well, Lewis will be back next year. I also just kind of assume in general that Mercedes Lewis is going to play until he is 78 years old or so, give or take. But overall, $8 million, that might seem like a big price tag, but I think it's worth it if only because he is a good blocker, a very good blocker, and among the Packers' tight ends, that makes him fairly unique. First and foremost, he's unique because of how big he is. 6'6", around 270, that's significantly bigger than any other tight end that is on the roster. Everyone else is more in the 6'4", 6'5", 230 range, more like a big wide receiver than a real tight end. As far as the tight end tight ends, you've got Robert Tunyon and Jace, uh, Jace Sternberger. Then you've got Josiah Dugara and uh, Dominique Nafney, and then a couple practice squad guys that really don't matter at this point. Among those five, Mercedes Lewis is very, very clearly the best blocker and really the only true inline tight end. That, I think, is reason enough to bring him back. And just given what he means to this offense, what Matt LaFleur likes to have from a tight end in this offense, I think it makes sense to have him around. Also, since we last spoke, we got numbers on Kevin King's contract. Uh, there's a lot going on here. And via Adrian Wilson, here is the the inside scoop on his contract numbers. Uh, King's deal is for five years, the final four void automatically if he's on the roster on the 23rd day preceding the first day of the 2022 league year. He's got $3.75 million in guaranteed money, $3.75 million in signing bonus, that is, uh, $1 million in salary, uh, and $200,000 per game active roster bonus. Uh, and he's got a million-dollar playtime and playoffs incentive in there as well. In English, this is a five-year deal that has four years that really don't count because they void automatically. They do this for cap purposes. You can stretch the impact over a longer period of time. Those last four years in that deal will void if King is on the roster about three weeks before the start of the 2022 league year. Ultimately, this ends up being more or less a one-year $3.75 to $4 million deal with a chance for it to go bigger, uh, depending on what incentives and bonuses King gets in there. It also looks like he's going to have a $3 million dead cap figure in 2022. To put a bow on all this, I don't really know why they did it this way. I don't know why you didn't just go a straight one-year deal with all those incentives built in. Why'd you have to stretch it out that way? Because it doesn't really seem like it's saving them all that much. I'm not sure why we're talking about this at all anywhere or anyway, because I I still don't understand what the selling point is here on Kevin King. We broke it down in the last episode, what you would say if you were trying to sell this deal as the Packers, and none of that really just adds up for me. But as you look at this deal, as you look at Mercedes Lewis coming back, as you look at Uh, what they've done with Aaron Jones and Preston Smith and and basically doing everything they can to bring the band back together from 2020, I'm starting to head towards a conclusion here. And I've, I've been thinking about putting this out there for a while, but it's pretty clear that the Packers thought they were, they were darn close in 2020 and it's hard to argue with them. They were, I mean, other than, I mean, you change four or five plays in that NFC Championship game. If you change two or three plays in the NFC Championship game, they're they're probably playing in the Super Bowl, and they've got as good a shot as anybody at winning. They're probably not going to put out the defensive effort against the Chiefs that the Buccaneers did, but Chiefs don't have the greatest defense in the world. I like the Packers against anybody in a track meet if it comes down to it. The Packers think they were close, so they're going to bring everybody back. What does that mean for the 2021 season? Well, I think it means one really big thing. It means a bunch of smaller things, but I think it means one real big thing. The bar for this year is extremely high. 
the bar can't just be making the playoffs and seeing what happens. It can't really even be get past the divisional round or get to the divisional round and see what happens. I think it's pretty clear what the bar is here. The Packers thought they were close. They brought back virtually their entire team other than their center, their starting center, a couple other smaller pieces. And to me, to me, that means the bar has to be Super Bowl or bust. That's what the Packers are saying. They're saying we were good enough to be in the Super Bowl and we're going to bring everybody back. Even if they weren't great, even if they leave much to be desired, we're going to bring everybody back. We're going to try to add in a couple draft picks and we're going to go for it. This is as close to all in as I think you're ever going to see the Packers. They are saying we were that close. Let's do it all again. And I think we have to set expectations accordingly. It's hard to get to any other conclusion. What do you say if you go to the NFC Championship game and you bring up back essentially the exact same roster, add in one draft class? Do you just say, well, we're going to be content with the NFC North. That's really the goal. And then we'll see what happens. No. You're saying we were good enough to get to the Super Bowl. Grade us accordingly. Yeah, it's March. Yeah, a lot of things can happen between now and the start of the season. But if the Packers are going to approach the offseason this way, I don't know what other conclusion you can come to. 2021 is going to be Super Bowl or bust. And given their apparent reluctance to move Aaron Rodgers' contract around, it seems like they are trying to leave themselves an out there sooner rather than later. Understanding that could still happen at any time. But if they were going to do it, why not have it done already? 2021 has got to be pretty much Super Bowl or bust. That's what the Packers are saying, and I think we kind of got to take them up on that. Let's continue our conversation about 2020 before we get too far into what our expectations are for the 2021 season, though. We've been going game by game through the 2020 season, reviewing what happened, when, and why. And we have reached week 14, in which the Packers traveled to Detroit to take on the Detroit Lions. In each of these games, we've been asking what happened Did anything emerge from this game that ended up being a long-term storyline or concern? And what did we forget about this game? Because I think there are quite often things that we forget as time goes on. So what happened? Well, the Packers went to Detroit and came away with a 34-21 victory. Excuse me, 31-24 victory over the Detroit Lions, who were overmatched pretty much from the start. Not really as close as it looked, but still was somewhat uncomfortably close. Packers went up 28 to 14 in the fourth quarter. Lions scored to make it 28 to 21 with six and a half to go. After a longish drive, three minutes or so, four minutes, uh, Mason Crosby made a 57 yard field goal to go up 31 21. Lions kicked a field goal to make it 31 24 with 90 seconds to go, but the Packers recovered an onside kick, had a bit of an adventure recovering it. But one first down later, that is all she wrote for the Detroit Lions. Probably shouldn't have been that close, but that happens. Especially down the stretch here at this point of the season, the Packers are essentially only playing for playoff positioning. The offense, though, was sharp in this game. They scored on five of seven non-game or half-ending drives. That is pretty darn good. We also saw probably, I guess for my money, Marquez Valdez-Scantling's best game of the season. We entered uh, the last pod talking about his uh, no-target game against the Buccaneers, or not the Buccaneers, the Bears, coming off the Packers' loss to the Colts, in which he played a big factor there, uh, fumbling in overtime. But this game, much better. Six catches on six targets, 85 yards, and a touchdown. That touchdown was a beautiful kind of back-shoulder, toe-tapper catch right by the goal line for the touchdown. Not bad. Devontae Adams also had a big catch and run for a touchdown. It's kind of the funny contrast there. You know, goal-line technician, Marquez Valdez-Scantling and, uh, you know, just wide-open sprinter Devontae Adams scoring touchdowns for the Packers, just as you would expect. Uh, Robert Tunyon also Tunyon also had a touchdown as well. The defense, a little less sharp, just kind of a blah effort. That's kind of a weird thing to say, I realize, about a four-sack, 24-point performance, but Detroit was right there, uh, right down the stretch with the Packers. Uh, they left a little bit to be desired. They gave up a lot of long-scoring drives again. 11 plays, 75 yards for a touchdown. 11 plays, 80 yards for a touchdown. 13 plays, 75 yards for a touchdown. That is kind of what you want. You want to make teams string out those drives, make them keep converting third downs and stuff like that. But still, 
you got to get a stop in there sooner or later, you'd think. So looking more broadly, did anything emerge from this game that's ended up being a longer-term storyline? Well, this was another bad special teams day for the Packers. Uh, a lot of penalties on special teams in this game, and they nearly screwed up the off- or onside kick and gave the Lions a shot to, uh, to uh, tie the game late. But uh, they managed to survive and uh, live to fight another day. What then did we forget about this game? A couple things. Uh, Tavon Austin made his debut for the Packers in this game, was around but inactive the previous week. Uh, Aaron Rodgers was not sacked uh, just the fourth time all year that he was not sacked. And A.J. Dillon, making his return from the COVID-19 reserve list, was active for this game against the Lions but did not play. Uh, felt pretty okay about that at the time, and I think in hindsight it felt just about the same. It, it's fine. He didn't have to rush him back especially in a a late-season game that doesn't necessarily mean all that much. Before we get to Weeks 15 and 16, I want to take a second and shout out a couple of our Patreon supporters. Today we are giving uh, hearty shout-outs to Angus Wayne, David Crocker, and John McDonald. Each of these fine individuals has been a Patreon supporter since 2018. And uh, no matter how long you've been a supporter, we value you because you help us keep this show ad-free because that's we, what we think is the best way to go about producing this podcast. If you would like to become a Patreon supporter as well, click the link in the show notes here. That'll take you over to our Patreon page. If not, patreon.com slash thepowersweep is how you get there. You can choose one of our support tiers, and uh, choosing any one of them will get you these benefits. You get some bonus content. You get uh, access to our special Discord server. And uh, again, you help us keep this entire show ad-free and uh, as well as uh, paying for things like studio upgrades and uh, hosting and all of the things that are required to uh, make this entire operation run. So we are grateful for your support and hope you will continue to support us. And uh, if you haven't, uh, consider joining us there as well. All right, week 15, the Packers are back at Lambeau Field taking on the Carolina Panthers. What happened in this one? Well, first, we need to remind everyone the Carolina Panthers were actually fairly good in 2020. Their record didn't show it, but they were competitive in a lot of games. And this was one of the teams, I think, that was hurt most by not having a traditional offseason. So they, they bring in a new coach. They bring in a new quarterback. They're starting a new program essentially from scratch. And what do you have happen? Well, you can't be in the building. You can't practice in person until summer and it kind of just goes from there. But they played a lot of teams pretty tough. Uh, They made it respectable against the Buccaneers in Week 2. They played the Saints pretty tough, uh, or only down by three points. Well, they only lost by three points, I should say. Uh, Only lost by two to the Chiefs. Uh, Only lost by a point to the Vikings, just two weeks, three weeks, excuse me, before they played the Packers. And then they bring their 4-9 and nine record to Green Bay to take on the Packers. Tough defense, uh, efficient enough offense, playing in bad weather at Green Bay. So where does that leave the Packers? In good shape if they can put up a big lead and maintain it. And the Packers got about half of that right. And boy, if you want to talk about that third quarter lull, this is the game for you. Packers built a 21-3 lead by scoring touchdowns on each of their first three drives, and then they took just a big old nap for most of the rest of the game. First play, or first drive, second drive, third drive, long touchdown drives. Not bad. But their fourth drive, seven plays, 34 yards, and a punt. From there, it gets real ugly. Four plays, one yard, and a punt. Three plays, three yards, and a punt. Three plays, negative one yard, and a punt. Four plays, 19 yards, and a punt. Finally, they get a field goal in the fourth quarter, then a punt, and then the end of the game. Kind of a damp, sloppy December day. Conditions seem to have made everything sloppy. Aaron Rodgers only 143 yards on 29 passing attempts. Aaron Jones, a big game on the ground, though. 20 carries, 145 yards, and a touchdown. A.J. Dillon back in the lineup, one carry for 18 yards, not too shabby. If you're talking about long-term storylines, I think the number one thing that you're looking at in this Bears-Panthers game is how the offensive line struggled against elite and or physical pass rushers. Brian Burns, the 2018-2019, excuse me, first-round pick for the Panthers, had two sacks. Derek Brown, their monster 2020 first-round pick, 
had two sacks coming mainly up the middle, rushing against guys like Lucas Patrick. F.A. Obata had one sack, five sacks in a game after not giving up one the previous week in Detroit. Maybe some foreshadowing about how to attack the Packers in the playoffs? Potentially. What then did we forget about this game? Well, first and foremost, maybe it was the five sacks, maybe it was something else, but Aaron Rodgers was quite salty after this game. Quote, we've got plans for the playoffs, and the way we played tonight on offense, we are not beating anyone in the playoffs. End quote. Uh, A little bit of foreshadowing there, too, because uh, a big reason the Packers lost in the playoffs was because their offense really couldn't convert on a couple key opportunities because of a, you guessed it, pretty darn good pass rush from the Buccaneers. Robert Tunyon got his 10th touchdown in this game. Packers defense played well, 12 ball hawks, not too bad. And then, right down at the end, this game ends up turning on the Panthers deciding to kick a field goal with just over two minutes to go. This was interesting because I think it's one of the big, one of the best examples of a blind spot. Let's call it that for analytics. Just over two minutes left, the Panthers were down 11 and kicked a field goal. Packers went three and out on the next drive, and the Panthers got the ball back with a chance to to tie with 55 seconds left. They needed a touchdown and a two-point conversion. So this is a big analytics thing. Thinking is you can save a timeout if you just take the field goal, kick off deep, thinking you'll get the ball back in time to drive and get the touchdown. In a vacuum, I think that generally makes sense, but football isn't played in a vacuum. Yes, I know the entire point of these, the analytics movement is looking at the overall trends and things like that, but in this particular game, here are some additional facts for which the analytics do not account. To that point, when the Panthers hung their entire game on needing to drive the length of the field to get a touchdown in 55 seconds, the Panthers had to that point scored one touchdown on four previous trips into the red zone. Their only touchdown scoring drive began on their own 49 and still took four minutes of game time. Their plan then resulted in them having to go 80 yards in 55 seconds, having not gone that far at any point in the game to that point. Does that seem like a really good idea? You can say, yeah, but what if they get into Hail Mary range? Okay, sure, but your quarterback at this point is Teddy Bridgewater, who's not exactly known for his big old cannon arm. On top of that, you're playing in pretty wet and windy and gross conditions in Lambeau Field in December, going against a pretty good secondary. And your plan is to get the ball with 55 seconds to go and go 80 yards, or let's say go 30 yards and have Teddy Bridgewater throw the ball up in the end zone. That's the plan? Okay. I need more than the numbers say it's a good idea. And I'm pretty analytics friendly on this podcast, I think. But just saying the numbers, the data say that's a good idea is not a good defense for asking Teddy Bridgewater to take you 80 yards in 55 seconds in bad conditions when he hasn't done that all day. Didn't make sense to me then. Still doesn't make sense to me now. Week 16, the Packers, fresh off their win over the Carolina Panthers, welcome the Tennessee Titans to Lambeau Field. What happened? No two ways about it. Packers smacked the Titans around. That's the size of it. Derrick Henry, the scariest running back in the NFL, 23 carries, 98 yards, a long of 10. A long of 10. That's pretty crazy. Ryan Tannehill, lauded by traditional media and the analytics world alike as being the king of efficiency. Well, he was horribly inefficient in this one. 11 of 24, 121 yards, a touchdown and two interceptions. Packers were straight up dominant on offense in this one. Uh, Offense scored six touchdowns, five drives of 60 yards or more. Not too bad. A.J. Dillon breaks out the snowplow in this one, bulldozing through the Titans' defense. 21 carries, 124 yards, two touchdowns. The only rookie in Packers history to have 20 carries, 120 rushing yards or more, and two touchdowns in the same game. Not too shabby, Mr. Dillon, and I hope we get to see a lot more of that in the future. We haven't even been mentioning a lot of his big stat lines, but Devontae Adams had a big one in this one, too. 11 catches, 142 yards, and three touchdowns. Again, not too bad. Speaking about long-term trends, 
we're thinking super long term in this one, even beyond the scope of the 2020 season. But this was our first real look at the Aaron Jones, A.J. Dillon backfield. Aaron Jones got a little bit banged up in this game, but still managed 94 yards rushing on 10 carries. He had a long of 59. A.J. Dillon, of course, 124 yards. Uh, They were in the backfield together a couple different times, and that's something that I'm hoping we see a lot of in 2021. In terms of what we forgot about this game, first and foremost, even though he was bad through the air, Ryan Tannehill had a big touchdown run on a read option play. Boy, if there's any team you'd think would be used to defending the read option, just dating back almost a decade now, you'd think it would be the Green Bay Packers. Alas, that is not the case. Equinemius St. Brown scored his first career touchdown. That's pretty exciting for him. Uh, Hopefully he can parlay that into a bigger performance in 2021. If not, that's probably going to be it for him, but that is neither here nor there. Uh, And just kind of as a statistical oddity, Aaron Rodgers had a five-yard scramble in which he covered 77 yards of uh, of ground, I guess, on the field, including what he did behind the line of scrimmage. So 72 yards behind the line of scrimmage to gain five yards downfield. Football is weird sometimes. So that takes us through Week 16. We are now up to the final game of the regular season and then two games in the playoffs, including the Packers' exciting win over the Los Angeles Rams in the divisional round. Yep, nothing else happened in the playoffs for the Packers, but that is for next time on uh, on Blue 58. In the meantime, that's all I've got for you right now. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it. If you would do me a favor and share this episode with somebody you think would enjoy it, enjoy it that would mean quite a bit to me, and I appreciate everybody who goes out of their way to help more people discover the show and uh, find us on Patreon and social media and all sorts of things like that. It really means a lot to me, and it's been really satisfying to watch this show grow. Ultimately, helping the show grow is going to accomplish our main goal of helping everybody become smarter Packers fans, including me, because as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.